Suele volumen Conversation with the people who were with me In the world TV Carlos tonight Carlos tonight Historias de un reportero everyone welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for watching and of course for listening i really appreciate that and before we get things started i want to invite you to check out my website that's carlostonight.com for the very latest on the podcast see upcoming guests and check out past episodes that's carlostonight.com well you know the oscars are coming up and i love the movies and this week my guest she also loves the movies her name is hannah studley she's a life coach a successful author and an Academy Award winner. Joining me now from Jerusalem. How's it going? How are you? Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I appreciate that. How are you? I'm great. It's uh, it's early in the morning. The sun is shining. I'm, I'm feeling good. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Good to have you here. And so today we're going to be talking about your um, Oscar Award winning work. Uh, the one and only John Travolta, and your coaching. But first, uh, I want to talk about uh, you as an author. And you write about a lot of uh, what some people may consider uh, sensitive topics. And one of them is PTSD. What led you to write that, um, that first book about PTSD? Well, I experienced a lot of trauma in my uh, 20s, back in the uh, early 1980s. I, I grew up in England. I was at uh, college in Manchester in the north of England, a university, and I was actually mugged three times. Um, the first time was when I was in college. I was at a nightclub. Um, the you know it's dark. Everybody's dancing. There's lots of confusion and music and loudness. And a young man wanted to dance with me. I I didn't know who he was, so I kind of pushed him away. And the next thing I know is his hand on the back of my head, and he smashed my head into a concrete pillar on the side of the dance floor, mm-hmm. and fractured my skull right here. I, I know you can't see it, but I can put my finger right on where, where the bone came back together. Um, um, I recovered from that one. It was kind of what happens when you're a student, you know. Well, in my community, anyway, we were all punk rockers at the time, and. Um, and then about three years later, I was walking about six o'clock in the evening near where I'd been living for a long time. And three men came out of the darkness, slammed me on the ground, beat the living daylights out of me. Um, I think they were looking for money. Um, I, I thought I was going to die. I, I can remember hearing myself screaming and thinking, if I can't catch another breath, I'm going to die. If they have a knife, I'm going to die. It was absolutely terrifying. And like I said, it was the early 1980s, so PTSD wasn't even a diagnosis. It, it may have just gone into the, you know, the books at that time. So in the north of England, all I got was a cup of tea. You were walking off and go home. That was my treatment. Oh, wow. So for the next 10 years, really, I suffered with reliving and reliving the events, reliving the torture of just going out my house. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd say about a year after that event, I decided to move down to London. I was starting my career in the entertainment business. And I was you know, trying to make a fresh start. And um, one night I was riding my bicycle home from the theater. We'd been um, setting up the production for the next day, I think. And about 10 o'clock in the evening, and I noticed this young kid, he was about 16 years old. And I noticed he was on a bicycle that was way too small for him, like a five-year-old's bike. Mm. And the next thing I, I knew, the bike came flying out the air at me. I took the impact in my neck and shoulders. He knocked me into the path of oncoming traffic. I mean, how a car didn't run me over, I don't know. Um, But then um, he made off with my bike and he sold it for about $70 the next day, I found out. Wow. He actually broke my neck. It was C2 and C3, the the vertebrae just below the skull. They were Mm -hmm. cracked through. Thank God, not the spinal cord. But um, that was it. I, you know, that kind of compound, all that compounded. I felt very unsafe in the world, very scared, terrified to leave the house because I knew something was going to happen to me. You know, it's like, right. right. I had police reports and x-rays to prove it. You know, the, the world's a dangerous place. And I went down very hard that, that third time. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't till um, a group of women from a crisis center really helped me and they got me back on my feet and they started helping me to see that I'm not my story. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of set me on a journey of personal transformation and self-help and training to be you know, a coach and a counselor. 
And it was years later, it was only about six years ago, um, which is 30 years after those events that I started to write. And I decided to put the, those stories into uh, a novel because I found, I mean, I'm weird. I like reading research, you know, <laughs> but yeah. not everybody does. And there's so much good information out there that people aren't hearing. So I decided to put all that information and my experiences into novels. So the first one's about trauma and recovering and going on to have this amazing Hollywood career. Mm -hmm. The second one is about chronic pain because I did have a lot of pain as a result of those injuries. Mm -hmm. And the most recent one is about hormones. It's a hormone adventure novel. So yes, they are sensitive subjects, mm -hmm. but the characters do the suffering and the falling down and the researching and the healing and the getting up and the happy endings. <laughs> Gotcha. Now, I've shared uh, a personal story here on the podcast. I, I was uh, involved in a uh, big car accident four years ago, and then I also suffered PTSD where um, just the, the screech of, of you know, uh, yeah. some tires on the road will set it off. And I remember in the beginning part, I would, you know, start to breathe heavily and kind of almost go into a panic mode. Yeah. Um, and I think the, a lot of people may not know what PTSD or how it uh you know, it impacts you. Um, did you have those same um, reactions yes, and symptoms? I did. Um, after the first event, I, you know, I, I kind of relived it and I couldn't understand why people weren't more sympathetic, you know, because what I find with PTSD is, is hypervigilance is one of the, the main um, symptoms of that. And we get very hypervigilant about sounds and or smells or places or certain people. And my friends had moved on. They, 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 my injuries had healed. You know, they moved on, and and you're still in this kind of stuck place yes. in, in terms yes. of your thinking. Um, and then I kind of got over that one. But when the second one happened with the three guys who beat me, I had the same thing as you. I had the sound of footsteps behind me. Mm -hmm. That would freak me out. Even years later, when I was, you know, I, that's why I said it lasted for over ten years because. I'd now moved to California. I'm living in Los Angeles. I've got this great life working in Hollywood movies. And I could be walking on the beach, you know, in, in Los Angeles, and and uh, it could just be someone jogging past me or a kid running for a bus. And I go, oh, you know? Yeah. And true. and it my because my nervous system had kind of learned how to um respond, which when when we're in a drama or in a crisis, that's a good thing. But with the, the problem with um you know, chronic chronic situations is it becomes what they call maladaptive and it starts to be um, unhelpful. And, you know, if you, if you don't understand what's happening, you know, we can freak out and think oh my, as if it's happening again. Mm -hmm. And, and then we can feel stuck in that feeling, but it really is an illusion. That's what I've kind of discovered with my mm -hmm. research and what I teach in my books is that we've innocently got caught up in illusion and it's almost become a habit. And then we're living in the feeling of the habit, feeling of the the, the repetitive thinking, mm -hmm. not in the actual situation because that's over, that's in the past. Yeah. And we are actually safe, but our brain thinks we're in danger. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, with this book, how does it feel being able to help people out there, uh, like myself who have, you know, has had uh, PTSD and mm -hmm. uh, or are probably going through it right now? Uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. I, I get so many um, letters and emails, you know, from people saying, thank you so much because, you know, you've articulated how I feel, you know, or you, you describe what I went through. And, you know, the fact that I came out of it, um, I was helped and I started seeing, I started to see that we're always feeling our thinking. And that is so much freedom there. And to be able to share that with other people and watch their lives um, open up and blossom like mine did it's, it's such a blessing um I, i've got countless stories of people who who are told that they would be they were broken and they would live like this for the rest of their lives and and you know be on medication or treatments or even in hospitals for the rest of their lives and to see them get well it's incredible i mean what a gift i feel very very blessed to be able to share that absolutely that's awesome now mm -hmm. for 30 years you've done uh, life coaching and now you're doing uh well-being what's the difference between those two um I think for me, what the difference is, when I was trained as a life coach, I was trained with very traditional techniques and methods and tools and tips and all those kind of things. And what I discovered is those techniques and tips, although they might be very useful in the moment, they're kind of temporary. They're not really 
long lasting. You have to keep going back to the journaling and the meditating and the expressive writing. And there's nothing wrong with those things. We, we, if they help, that's amazing. We don't want people to suffer. Right. But what I've been taught more recently is to go further upstream and to understand how experience is created and to see that everybody has innate health, everybody has well-being. And the only reason we're not in touch with that is because we've innocently got caught up in our thinking. It's kind of like when you learn to drive, you know, at first you have to have the driving instructor or your mom there and you're like scared. But when you know how to drive, you don't need a teacher anymore. You're free and you have independence to go and do what you want. So my clients don't have to stay with me for long periods of time because when they have an insight, when they shift in their thinking and they see that they are safe and that the event is in the past, or even if it's an ongoing you know, relationship situation, they're in a better state of mind to deal with it. And and that's real freedom, yeah. You know? Absolutely. Um, what's your uh, advice for people who, um, you know, maybe experiencing anxiety and how to overcome that? I know for me, uh, breathing was a big help. Yeah. Uh, you know, breathing, doing the whole type of thing, uh, or maybe slower or whatever. Uh, that yeah. helped me a lot. Uh, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I was trained as a trauma counselor. I'm, I'm a trained first responder. So breathing is definitely part of the picture. When someone's in a panic attack, when someone's even catatonic, that they've seen, you know, an accident or, you know, they've got into such a, a, a anxious state that they are not thinking straight. It's the brain needs oxygen. So slowing down the breathing, I, you know, that is something very, very important. But what I'm working towards now is helping people before they get into such a state because we, we want to um, triage you know it's very good to know how to help someone when they're in that state but we want to help people um, before they're falling down the mountain into that disaster mm -hmm. so what i share with people now is what really helped me is that we live in a thought created world you know we're always feeling our thinking so for the longest time i thought the way i felt and my emotional state and everything was as a result of my circumstances or my past or my relationships or politics or the, the loud neighbors or you name it I, I i wanted to blame i wanted to to put the cause of it on the outside things i know the word triggered is very popular these days that yeah. things trigger me but what i found out what that that's not actually possible because if we're always feeling our thinking, then we live in our own thought created realities, if you like, because let's say you and I go to watch a movie, one of us might love it and the other one might be bored stiff. So it can't be the movie that's producing our experience. It's our thinking about it. And that's same true of sports and politics and mm -hmm. the weather, you know, yeah. where you go for your vacation. Some people like it, some people don't like it. So if we're only ever experiencing or thinking about things, even the past, even, even a traumatic thing, then the freedom that comes with that is that I'm not a victim of that anymore. Mm -hmm. When I understand that thought is, my thinking is constantly moving. And if I know I have innate well being underneath that stinky thinking, then all I have to do is kind of like become aware, oh, I got caught up in my thinking, mm -hmm. um, come back to the moment where we are safe and, and our resilience is right there for us that um i i found that i don't i don't go into you know a panic attack anymore i, mean, I can have a funky day like anybody else i'm, I'm human yeah. but it doesn't develop into a, a you know a full-blown attack anymore or my chronic pain doesn't fire up anymore mm -hmm. because my nervous system has kind of calmed down right. and that's that's become normal to me now that's awesome. and so if i if i do get a, like a spike of something it's like yeah you know i don't want yeah. that and, and it goes away <laughs> like stay back <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Cool. Now, earlier you mentioned you lived in California. I lived in California for about eight years reporting mm -hmm. the news. You were on the film side. What was mm -hmm. that like? Was it 20 years you were working in film? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had this about 20 year career in the entertainment business. I started out in the theater and then TV and then movies, which took me to California. Um, it was amazing. I mean, it, it really was amazing. I got to fly around the world working the most famous people. My first movie was with Steven Spielberg and Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, wow. not too shabby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. I mean, I'd never been on a movie set before. I, I was, I, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I, I winged it and made the best of it. And then, um, so that was the Flint, Flintstones. If you remember the first Flintstones movie. Oh yes. Because <laughs> um, I, I was, I did special effects, so mm -hmm. I was known for making animals. But I, but in Flintstones, we made all the Dick to Bird and the, the Dino months, you know, all the dinosaur stuff, mm -hmm. which is kind of 
easy looking back because no one can tell you it's the wrong shade of green when you're making a monster. Right? <laughs> but then I went on to make copies of real animals. Um, so any movie that had a talking animal in the 80s and 90s, I would have made it. Like uh, Babe, we got an Academy Award for Babe. Mm. Um, I did Dr. Doolittle with Eddie Murphy. Um, I, I did an alien movie, I, lots of those kind of things. George of the Jungle, I made a lion for, with Brendan Fraser. Um, and then, uh, then I made some angel wings for John Travolta. That's how I got to meet him. Oh, cool. You mentioned all these people that are up for Oscars this year. Which is <laughs> cool. uh, oh, real quick. Um, do you remember a show called Dinosaurs on ABC? Yes. A sitcom? Did you work on that? Um, I didn't, but my colleagues did. It was, it's the same, like a branch of the same company. Like I was always freelance, but I mostly worked for Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Awesome. And I believe that, that, that Henson's made, made those puppets. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were talking about that. That's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, I know all um, the movie stars. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, so tell us about being on the set of Babe. On um, Babe, um, it was actually filmed in Australia. Um, I was still living in London at the time, and so we built all the creatures in, in London and then shipped them out to Australia. Um, it's funny, the, the book is actually set where I grew up in England, so it was kind of funny to oh, go cool. all the way, ha halfway around the world to film it. But an Australian <laughs> production company had bought the, the rights to the book, so that's Hollywood for you. So we fly halfway around the world to, <laughs> to make a bit of Southern Australia look like a bit of Southern England. Um, <laughs> And, and it was amazing. I mean, we were literally in fields for six months. They actually had a, a farm with all the animals. The pig that plays Babe, there were actually, if I remember right, 26 pigs that played Babe because pigs grow. And over six months, the pig at the beginning of the movie was too too big for the, for the end of the movie. Um, um, and it was a female pig because boy pigs are not pretty from the behind. Um, <laughs> you know, it's all this secret. So you, you find like Hollywood secrets <laughs> behind the scenes. You know? um, it was amazing. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, working with the animals as well. And then um, when you all heard that you were um, nominated for an Academy Award, um, what was that feeling like, um, getting that, that news? Mm, it, it was amazing. It really is. I mean, especially back then, I mean, the Academy Awards have kind of taken a different, um, route now. It's, it's, it yeah. seems, I, I don't even watch it much anymore. It seems a bit like a, a high school show <laughs> to me now, but exactly. back in, it was still kind of the, the, the glory Hollywood yeah. days. I mean, it was, you know, to, to be, um, to be counted in that. I mean, obviously special effects is not the same as you know, the actor department, you know, awards, but it does actually happen on the same night. I don't know if you know this, but there are two Academy Awards ceremonies. There's one that you see televised on television. Um, and then there's the one that's for all the behind the scenes people. Yeah. So our category actually happens on the night of, uh, with all the, the actors. So that's really special. Um, and I did not get to go up and get the statue because they only have um, four na maximum of four names on a statue. So my boss um, uh, and some of the digital people they got you know got to go up and go. But you know the the feeling was you know I was actually working on a, the movie with John Travolta at the time, and I remember uh, William Hurt came up to me and congratulated me, and I'm like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> it was very cool. <laughs> Being at an Oscar party with a film crew when you're on location, it's really, really fun. Because you know? so, yeah, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody. It's, it's, it's amazing, yeah. Oh yeah, it's just mm -hmm. kind of like TV news where everyone knows everyone. And yeah. You work with <laughs> this person and that person. Um, yeah. And speaking of Texas, that's where I'm um, broadcasting from today. And oh, nice. um, you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned that uh, John Travolta um, was shooting, was it Michael? The movie yes, Michael? a movie called Michael. He plays an angel. Um, with William Hurt and um, Andy McDowell. And I don't know if you remember, it's like 20 years ago now, but I had to make his wings. And um, <laughs> so I made several sets of wings um, and went to his house to fit them. He's, he's such a wonderful person. He was very kind and very generous, very funny. Um, so I had I spent many, many hours gluing these uh, uh, feathers, to, blending them into his skin, which you don't often see in the movie. It's amazing how much work goes in and doesn't actually <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't actually end up, you know, on the screen. Um, but yeah, we spent a lot of time together. And then um, we were filming a scene, um, I don't know if your, your viewers will remember this, but there's a scene when he collides with a bull, like on the horizon in the distance. So I had to be out there with him to set the wings because they kind of flip up as he runs towards the bull. And 
we were about a mile away from the film crew. So it's just me and him for like a day, you know, in a field in Texas, just outside Austin. And um, one time he started um, saying to me, um, you'd look really cool if you wore this, you know, he's designing me an outfit. And I, and I took the chance and I said, if I wore that, would you dance with me? And he said, oh, I'd dance with you anytime, but not now. Action, you know, rushes off right. to do his thing. <laughs> And then a few days later, we were filming uh, a scene where he has to dance with a, a waitress, I think it is. So they have the playback of the, the music. I think it was Aretha Franklin or some, some great music. And he turned to me in front of the whole crew and said, now. And I'm like, what? He said, we're going to dance now. And it was oh like two o'clock in the morning in a field. Um, and I, I, he was twirling me around. I, I honestly felt like Princess Diana of the White House. Um, you know, it was, a, I've got 70 guys watching. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I had a photograph of it, but um, it's, you know, it's one of my, my favorite memories because it, it, he was a gentleman. He was so kind and, and uh, really polite and generous to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the locals had stood hours and hours and hours just watching and he could have just gone back to his trailer and he would sign autographs for people. And the press weren't there. Nobody knew about that. He just was a really decent person. Uh, he still is, I'm sure. And um, so well, it was a great, <laughs> a great honor to, to, to spend that time with him. Yeah, That's awesome. Um, at what point in your career in Hollywood did you um, kind of realize, I made it? Besides winning the Oscar, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was the sec our second movie for the Oscar, <laughs> which was pretty good. Um, you know, my actually, the most special moment I ever had was actually on the first movie with on the Flintstones. Mm -hmm. I was walking on the back lot at Universal Studios, still like, you know, in awe, like, I can't believe I'm here. And John Goodman, who played uh, Fred Flintstone, mm -hmm. he was walking by from his trailer back to the stage and he went, hi, Hannah. And I thought, oh, John Goodman knows my name. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. And he, he again, he was also a really lovely person to work with, a lot, a lot of fun. Um, I mean, that was on my first movie and I felt like, I mean, I'd done a lot of theater and TV before I got there, but for, for someone to remember my name, you know, that was the first time it happened. And yeah. I think that's when I felt like I'd arrived. After that, you know, they, you know, movie stars are, they all put their, you know, their trousers on the same way everybody else does, as we say, right. you know. Absolutely. So, you know, beating Eddie Murphy and Steven Spielberg and that, I'm like, oh yeah, whatever now. Yeah. You miss it at all? Um, not really. I mean, I had a great time. It lasted a long time. I, I left, you know, because I wanted to, I was ready to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. Um, Stuart Little was the last movie. I actually turned it down. Um, cause I, I really wanted to leave. I became a school teacher. If you can believe oh. that. I wanted to become a school teacher. Um, and, and people often ask me how, you know, how did you go from doing special effects in Hollywood movies to coaching people with chronic pain, for example? Mm -hmm. Um, and my, my, my quick answer is it's all an illusion. You know, my, my whole career in Hollywood was about um, convincing you things were real that weren't, like a dog can talk or that Harry Potter can fly. Well, actually Harry Potter can fly, you know, it's Daniel Radcliffe can, you know, we put yeah. him in a harness and off he goes. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the things with PTSD and trauma and, and chronic pain and hormone distress, it's the brain is creating illusions and pain is the ultimate special effect because it's making us feel like there's something wrong with our bodies or that we're in danger and we're really not. And so that's how I kind of see the connection now. It kind of my Hollywood career kind of helped me with the work I'm doing now. And it's great to chat about that stuff because it gets people relaxed and, and when the people are relaxed in a better mood, they're more open to new ideas and healing and getting better and letting go of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, to me, it's all connected. It's just smoothly gone from one thing to the other. And now writing books is, you know, just putting all that down on to paper for people to see behind the scenes. Yeah. Do you ever get somebody asking you, uh, advice on, on working in Hollywood? Um, not now. Cause it's, it's been, um, it's been a while since I was there. Like all the people I, I worked with, I mean, behind the scenes, I don't know if they're still working, they might've moved on as well, but, um, I think, I think what the best advice that I got was to be yourself, um, and don't take no for an answer. And it really is about being in the right place at the right time, you know, cause there are some incredibly talented people who don't seem to get a break. Um, I felt very lucky that I, you know, I got the break and, and I got to 
I, I mean, I was working in a very specialized niche kind of area, making talking animals, you know, that's not really on the career advisors list when you're in high school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so to get paid silly money and travel around the world doing that was, <laughs> was actually incredible that I got a chance to use the skills I have to, you know, to be in, in that industry. Um, but I think it's, it, it's, um, you kind of need a tough skin as well. There's, you know, as much, there's some really wonderful people. There's could be some backstabbing and some, you know, all that kind of stuff happens as well, like in any other industry. Yeah. So you just kind of have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and show up and, and, um, and, and trust that. And also I think the other advice which I would give is it's very seductive and it's very easy to think you're only as good as your last project or the car you're driving or who, you know, or what you're working on. And that's not who we are. You know, and I think that was one of the reasons why I was ready to leave, because um, I wanted to, you know, do something that was, you know, kind of fill my my spirit and my soul more than than, you know, um, another Levi's commercial or something. Right. <laughs> um, so so this yeah, is your, think, your your next chapter. Yeah, exactly. So if if you are in, the, the, it's a wonderful business, but you just just remember who you really are. You're not you're not the job. Yeah. So any advice uh, uh, for anyone who wants to write a book? Oh. Um, Get out, it, you know, <laughs> the best advice I was given by, a, I had a neighbor in London who was a very successful romantic author. You know, there's kind of um, corset busting. <laughs> she wrote those kind of like romantic Mills and Boone novels. And she told me, she said, get out a pen and start writing. You know, she said, she's often asked, how do you be, be a successful author? She said, well, you start writing. Or if you want to be a successful actor, you start acting. You know, if you're, even if you're doing it for the local old people's home or just writing it and just your mom's going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, now we have, you know, self-publishing. So anybody can publish anything. It actually is free. It doesn't cost you any money. So, you know, I'm like, open up a Google Doc or a Word document and start writing. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can go back and change it and go back and change it. Um, you know, I change things all the time and thank God for spell check and editors. And <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect straight away and don't have to start at the beginning. Even I started in the middle and then, you know, filled in spaces afterwards with the first one. I actually find the writing part, the easy part of it, the publishing, the editing, the formatting and all that stuff, you know, uploading it, that could be a bit, you know, um, trying at times. And when you're waiting on other people to edit it or give you reviews, that can be frustrating. So the writing to me is the easy part. I'm already halfway through my next one. And I've got ideas for four, five, and six, which is wow. almost frustrating because I, I, you know, trying to find the time to actually get, get them written. But um, I, I enjoy it. I love it. It's, it's That's a great, awesome. yeah. And I saw that your books are doing real good on Amazon. Can you um, tell us a little bit about how we can uh, purchase a book and find you? Yeah. So, yeah, oh, I have three books. The first one is called The Myth of Low Self-Esteem. That's the one about trauma um, and recovery. Um, and the second one is called Painless. And it's a novel about me recovering from um, chronic pain. 25 years of chronic pain I had. All gone now. Um, and the latest one, which came out just a couple of weeks ago, is called Very Well. Um, and that's the one about um, hormones. It's a, a, a story about a woman and her two daughters who go through all kinds of hormonal distress and, and come out the other side of it symptom free. Um, they're all on Amazon. Um, so you can look up my name, Hannah, Hannah Studley, and, and those books. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're there for you to um, enjoy. <laughs> and then uh, you have a website too, right? Yes, that's my name, hannahstudley.com. It's spelled C-H-A-N-A-S-T-U-D-L-E-Y. And there you can see information about the books, about my programs, about my coaching. Um, I'm do, I do wellness retreats as well. I did one in Cape Cod last year. I'm doing one in Amsterdam this year and, and speaking in conferences. Um, yeah, so that's all on the website. That's awesome. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. And I know everyone will get a kick out of hearing your stories, uh, especially those in Hollywood. So continue success uh, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.